I just want to thank the three of you for the very inspiring and entertaining presentations, which is very rare. And I mean, we don't have much time left, I think. So I, 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 if you have any questions, by all means, ask. I just want to make a general, general comments to get us started. So I think from all of your very different discussions, like the message, the, 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 one of the common messages, like, yeah, this anthropomorphization, this characterization animals, is most of the time misplaced. So we are really imposing our, our expectations, sometimes even physically, on these animals. And most of the time, and like, sometimes, I guess, it's like at negative repercussions, like this last example of cat wars. They may, these, our expectation may mask uh, real behaviors in animals that can have negative consequences. But I guess what I'm thinking, uh, what I would like to talk about is, is this anthropomorphization, this projection we do, is completely misplaced uh, and we should stop doing it? I mean, as scientists, we definitely should avoid it in our research. But uh, as a cultural phenomenon, do you think it has any value uh, culturally and evolutionary also? I'm very interested in like, do you think it helped us approach the animals and maybe this is why we initially domesticated animals and it may help us to uh, get more interested in animals or it's most of the time <laughs> to avoid? I have to say, am I on? Or I'll just speak loudly. Um, that it, I, I think that anthropomorphisms are usually considered um, a kind of involuntary perceptual strategy. So whether or not they um, are appropriate, it's almost the result of our way of looking at the world, that we're not going to escape from them completely, and that maybe the best we can do is just be aware of the ways that our perceptual understanding and our cognitive facility shapes how we look at others. And in fact, there is something to be said for, um, I think, immediately giving kind of the benefit of the doubt to the un something that's unfamiliar. Um, but I'll give a very kind of anecdotal example of how, for instance, I heard about um, dogs being anthropomorphized in a way which I think is useful. So after I, I spoke in Michigan, um, some members of the Michigan Humane Society came up and told me that they use the guilty look um, in helping to adopt dogs. They teach the dogs the guilty <laughs> look um, so that the owners are more likely to attribute a kind of understanding and a responsiveness to this new animal. Um, and then later on, they disabuse them of the notion that they were, you know, <laughs> that then say it was really taught to them. But in some ways it starts, it opens that empathy possibility um, as long as we then maybe remain critical of our judgments, they're not all necessarily wrong. I just think they, they deserve some scrutiny. Okay, that's a great example. So yeah, we can use it in favor of the animals. Yeah. We can learn how to use it. Great. I would say that <clears throat> anthropomorphism is a word that is applied to a large range yeah. of, um, of perceptions and the sense that it is always a criticism I think is a problem um, because, I mean, there are things like, to use a Victorian example, when they um, reported on stud visits as weddings, you know, so that's at one end of the spectrum. But at the other end is an actual recognition, you know, as you said, that uh, mammals, vertebrates even, share many. Um, emotional and maybe even intellectual characteristics and often I think the critique of the, the, the kind of knee-jerk use of anthropomorphism as a critique is a way of um, reinforcing the difference between people and other animals rather than recognizing the qualities that we have in common. Great. Thanks. So I, it has been argued that the reason that cats are so popular is that they have all the traits that Alexandra spoke about, the big eyes, the big forehead, and so on. They, they bring out the response that we have towards babies. And maybe that is a reason that cats are, are popular as well. So the question I have is maybe a bit of a tangent, but 
why are we breeding these crazy varieties? I can understand the Bengal cat, it's beautiful, but these very odd looking or extreme forms, it's happening with both dogs and cats today. Uh, extreme forms that we know in many cases are detrimental to the health of the animals. What is, is it just that they're different? Is it has something to do with this anthropomorphism or is it a different issue? I, I would say that it's, um, I mean, it's an old, it, I mean, as long as people have been breeding, they've been, they, there have been some of them who have been breeding for eccentricity. It, it seems to me it's a way of demonstrating power, um, the, the ability to manipulate, and also, you know, to be unscientific. Um, it's something that is very monetizable. That, that is the, the, I mean, I mean, this has been from, you know, from the 18th century anyway. If you can call something a breed, and if you can prove that it reproduces uh, predictably, then you get a label, and it is more, it, it, it's more expensive. Great, thank you. No, yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of the things I want to do here, so like a way to do it more. <laughs> Accepting is something we do, and it's probably, to, like, it has an evolutionary component, but also use it for the animal benefits. I don't know if, yeah, if there are questions, please. Yeah. Um, since the title of this seminar was Cat and Animals in Science and Fiction, and this is an I'll ask this question. How valid is Herman Hesse's characterization of this Steppenwolf as an anthropomorphized wolf? <laughs> I haven't read the book in 50 years. Hmm. I have to say, I haven't read it for a long time either. I remember it as excessively silly. Yeah, I can't answer that. Before you talk. No, my emphasis is on the science part, I'm afraid, <laughs> not the fiction part. Yeah. Yeah, please. So, um, um, Ian Wilson, farmer, um, had talked about biophilia, right? Which is, I think, and you see it in little children, it's almost an innate interest uh, in all living things. And it seems like when I interact with little children, they're just in butterflies, caterpillars, uh, you know, mice, cats and dogs. But as you grow older, the only thing you find in your household really is going to be cats and dogs. Now, there are others who will go for the more exotic pet, and the exotic pet trade is really quite big. Lots of pet lizards, lots of pet fish, lots of pet birds. But then cats and dogs just has its features of things. So I was wondering, you know, um, you said earlier that the anthropomorphized objects, too. I mean, I think that sense of early animacy is definitely on a par with the early anthropomorphic tendencies. And then culturally, we're just, there's a categorization that comes up culturally about which, which, which objects or animals you're going to eventually, or you're supposed to put in one or another group. And some people don't ever learn, lose that early animacy and still are identifying with, I mean, maybe, you know, I have a weakness for broken chairs, for instance, you know, there's something sad to me or poignant about a broken chair, not that I really know, I don't intellectually experience that it's having an experience, but there's something poignant 
um, to me still about it is that there's a little residual animacy. So I feel like that that is considered um, a kind of inherited trait that we have, which in, and one could argue and has been argued that it is adaptive to view the world that way, to start with sort of the, you know, what one knows and project that out and then pare down um, when that isn't effective at explaining the behavior or effective at characterizing one's world. And there is a, there is a difference between um, anthropomorphism and personification. But why the particular species that are so common, dogs and cats, why not goldfish or, I mean, some people do have goldfish, right. or rabbits. Well, people it, do it. People do have, have some rabbits. Well, there, I mean, there's a lot of research on, on why we, um, the differences between the species which we tend to love and we tend to not love. And you could even include those that we, that we keep as pets or that we eat for instance, is another division. And some of them do seem to have physically the traits that we're familiar with or that we can identify with. Um, so it's not very hard to find a consensus on ugly animals, for instance, and those are the ones nobody, nobody um, adopts and um, fish, lump fish type of things. And on the other hand, the ones who get a lot of money um, if they're endangered are the ones who have these familiar features. Um, and also ones who apparently are, can be given life stories. Um, so it's easy to give them a name and, and, and describe them in human terms. Those are ones endangered animals who seem to get the most money. Um, but why dogs in particular, I'd say, I mean, they're also is they're, they're the mapping of the species to our social life is also very useful. They're a social species and they're very flexible social species. So they could be easily um, adjusted by similar means as you were mentioning, like reduction in fearfulness or more um, approachability to humans to suddenly be in our social world instead of just isolated in their own. So there, so you, and I think that's in way, I mean, I'm maybe biased, but I think that's why dogs are more successful as social companions in some cases um, than this quasi domesticated cat, which is less social generally. Okay. But I'm going to take one question from, I'm kind of ignoring this side. Uh, it's a genetic, it's a biological term. <laughs> Please. Agreed. Uh, it's clear that how dogs are domesticated This is argued sometimes, I mean, people call it, talk about co-domestication. And it's a way, I feel like it's more of a way of talking about the, what happened, that we opened uh, the relationship to including an animal within the family unit more than strictly um, a description of what happened to us genetically as a result of affiliation with dogs. Um, but yeah, there, that's a, the language that some people use, co-domestication. Uh, Andrew? system that maybe has co-evolved and co-domesticated and, and having the motivation of the research, cognitive research in particular, not to be what are the animals believing or thinking, but how, how is the system interacting in order, you know, I just wonder what you think of that perspective, uh, because it, it plays into a lot of the concerns I think in cognitive science these days with extended cognition and body cognition. Yeah, I, I mean, I come from a cognitive science department that was actually very um, rich with talk of uh, distributed cognition and, and so forth and um, I think it can explain a lot. It, it's an explain, in my mind, it's an explanatory worldview which is kind of complementary to an, um, another worldview which is not always fully successful, which is a more individual cognition worldview. Um, and that just happens to be the side that I'm in. But I, I recognize and I, and I do think that it has an explanatory function, but maybe not an exclusive explanatory function. Yeah, there's a question down there and then here.
uh, I'm not sure that I have thought about that. I mean, I'm not. Uh, it's it's intriguing, and I love, and I I'm interested in the in what I do not know that much about um, uh, the cross cultural differences and what the considerations of what animals we consider it animals uh, and what animals will take not just as pets but animals that will consume and what animals um, we disregard and what we and what we covet um, it's certainly different culturally and I really am only steeped in a Western tradition um, admittedly Harriet do you have any thoughts on that no <laughs> me if anyone yeah from the public uh, has any feedback on that Yeah? Comment or a question? Well, I mean, I think this is a uh, most likely question of what Professor Ritko wrote. Um, so, I'm, I'm just wondering if someone from Munich or Ukraine might have been working on the natural history of other things. And um, your talk, uh, most of the other, your talk in particular, let, uh, yeah, made me think about anthropomorphism as an epistemic bias, as something that scientists have to avoid doing at all costs. Uh, and I was wondering, do you know when? You know, I don't know. I mean, a quick look at the OED would probably tell, say when, when it, I mean, because I, I have a feeling that until what followed from, say, Darwin's The Expression of Emotion uh, in people, in humans and animals, um, you know, it went without saying that this gulf existed. So people didn't need to be warned about it until it started to be explicitly breached, even though, of course, there's a long tradition of um, interpreting uh, people as animals and animals as people. I mean, there's the physiognomical tradition and, and all of that kind of Kind of things, but uh, th this is a guess. But as I say, um, I can look it up in the OED uh, immediately um, to see when um, it became formulated in this particular way. My guess is fairly recently. You know, my, uh, can, I, can I add that my understanding of the history of anthropomorphisms is not great, but that there was always a cast of um, of um, uh, censor about an anthropomorphism, whether it was to a god or, um, well, gods being the first, that they shouldn't reflect us um, for a different reason than we would now censor anthropomorphisms. But certainly that cast was in the very earliest writings. That is in Xenophanes' writings. But post-Darwin and Romanes, who were such um, huge anthropomorphizers, there was a real reaction against it. So I would say in science, in particular, you would look at right past their time. There was a specific reaction to Romanus's characterization of, of dogs as feeling um, spite and so forth, and this, this type of language. And then of course that in America that led to behaviorism, um, so that came at this time of this different approach, alternate mindless approach to looking at animals. Great, yeah. One more, one more, the last one. <laughs> Accepting that we are so much more similar 
I see the you know the food relationship between a, a dog and its owner as being you know very very instrumental, and you know I wonder do you think the result would be different if mm. it were possible to study with more of an emphasis on the relationship between the animal and you know, like the yeah, um, potentially. I mean, I think that's that's always relevant when we're talking about designing studies that involve um, owner the owners with the dogs, whether the that is the dynamic that's going to define the behavior of the dog. Um, I will say that the my study was in some way modeled on human psychology studies, which showed that we're averse. We are reverse. The studies uh, have shown to, and there's a whole literature of this of inequity aversion to um, both kinds of unfairness. Um, we react differently in both cases. Um, if so, if we're getting paid, they, they, the, the classic model is payment for a job. Then you find out that these were college students that, for instance, that the other students are getting paid more for the same job or they're getting paid less. And um, when the end, but the students react, have a response to aversion to kind of make it equal in those cases. If they're getting paid less, um, they start working less hard. So they, res they respond by noticing the unfairness and changing their behavior. And if they're getting paid more, they attribute it to themselves. They say that they must be very good at the task as compared to the other ones. So they, but those are also not done typically, and you wouldn't in most human psychology experiments with, with familiar participants and experimenters. And, and also, I, I think about, you know, children. There's, yep. there's something about, you know, the filtration factor and, and development of the brain. That but remember that children, we wouldn't say, have a fully developed sense of fairness. So they're a kind of evolving cognition. Yeah. Okay, unfortunately, I think we're out of time. But yeah, there is much more to think about. You can stay at the reception and talk more to our speakers. Meanwhile, join me in thanking them.